So, um, Allison had this, you know, expertly prepared introduction, which uh, she didn't give for me. So I'll give my own introduction. I'm teasing. I gave Allison a funny one. So this is my background. Um, I am a member of the faculty uh, at Tepper. I teach entrepreneurship um, at the graduate and the undergraduate levels. Um, and uh, I am also an alumni. I graduated from Tepper back in 1997. Uh, it was not called an MBA back then. It was called a master's in industrial administration. So I am an alumni um, as well as a member of the faculty. Um, I am also a mechanical engineer um, and, and practiced as such for many years. Um, my, my ME degree is, is from West Virginia University. Um, and I have done, uh, I've been a part of five startups. Um, one of them I was not a founder of or a co-founder. And then I have founded or co-founded four others. Um, and the logos of those are, are listed here. The first was a mechanical engineering and manufacturing company called Vertec Enterprises. It is in, uh, located in, outside of Cleveland. Uh, still exists. My my co-founder runs that company, and and uh, it remains a very successful company. Um, Midsage Technologies was my my first software startup. Uh, I started that in 2002 and sold it to Philips Electronics in 2010. I also did a a startup in the long-term care space called New Care Solutions, which was an IoT product. So it had software and uh, hardware. And uh, I am now doing a, a startup called Sovasage that is in the home healthcare space that uses artificial intelligence and computer vision to disrupt the home healthcare uh, care delivery channel, especially for patients who have a disease called sleep apnea. Uh, so I, I've done a number of startups. I've been members of other startups. Um, and I also, by the way, and I think this is slightly relevant here to this topic, um, ran a, 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 a CEO peer-to-peer -peer group uh, called Vistage um, and, uh, for small businesses. And the reason that's relevant to this topic that we're going to cover today is that uh, I used this, this tool, the Business Model Canvas, as a tool to help um, uh, CEOs and entrepreneurs uh, evaluate um, and plan new business, business extensions, business acquisitions. This is, this is a tool that I've used as an entrepreneur, as kind of a consultant in that role and an advisor. Um, I, I do think that this tool uh, can be very valuable. I also think that it is often used incorrectly. So today what I'm going to do is take you through uh, you know, the way I uh, teach people to use this tool. And to start out with, let me give you uh, how it, a, a summary of how it's used incorrectly, right? So I've also worked for large companies. I, I worked for a company called Respironics, which was a very large medical device manufacturer. I worked for UPMC Enterprises, which everybody probably uh, knows about UPMC. Uh, the enterprise group is their investment and innovation team. Um, and, and I've worked with a number of other large companies. Um, I'm, what I'm about to say is not an indictment on any of these companies specifically, but perhaps an indictment on large companies in general. Um, large companies tend to use the business model canvas um, as you know, a box to check, something that they've done to make sure that they uh, can document that they have thought about all the different things that might need to be considered when evaluating a new business idea. Um, and, and my hypothesis, my assertion in this talk today will be that that is the incorrect way to use this product, this tool, right? So um, let's go through how I suggest you use a tool like the Business Model Canvas. And, and the first thing I like to do, especially considering the fact that Carnegie Mellon is, is, you know, um, uh, just packed with tremendous technical talent is to draw a reference to um, how uh, people from the technical field um, tend to look at business planning, right? And, and often I'll get this question, 
it's really all about the product. So why should I waste time modeling out a business, right? It, you know, it brings to mind the old phrase, if you build a better mousetrap, uh, the world will beat a path to your, to your door, right? That's a very old phrase. Most of you are probably too young to remember that. Um, but, um, uh, you know, there is, there is a line of thought that you really just need to focus on the product. Now, I'm about to tell you that the business model um, is equally as important. I am not telling you the product's not important. Uh, the product is extremely important and having a good product market fit is part of what the business model canvas helps ensure that you do. But let's talk about business models and how you can innovate with them just to illustrate my point with a few examples. So some of you may remember a company called Rosetta Stone. Still exists. Um, it, it used to be by far the innovator in, um, uh, in language education, um, direct to consumer. It was founded in the early 90s. Um, it was the first real leader in digital language learning. Um, and it was pretty innovative in a couple different ways. Um, one of those ways uh, was that their channel was entirely unique. So, so they, they focused on the high end of the market um, and many of their sales, especially in the early days, were through a, a kiosk strategy, like the picture here, um, found in airports. There was no airport in the United States that you wouldn't find one of these kiosks. And they were generally very prominently displayed and if you wanted to buy a module that would help teach you French, for example, uh, you know, it, it, it might cost you anywhere from $350 to $600. It was not cheap. Um, and uh, uh, that strategy was a premium pricing strategy. They did very well with it. Their, their, their cost uh, to produce the product was, from a variable perspective, was actually very low. It was mostly content and software-based um, and you know, on a on a CD or a, a disc, right? Uh, until of course something happened, right? Something changed, and that change actually uh, came from Carnegie Mellon. There's a company called Duolingo. Um, Duolingo took the concept that Rosetta Stone had, and and converted it from a disc that you would load onto your computer to a mobile application. Right, and they added gamification. They introduced that product, and 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 Luis Fanon was the founder of that from our computer science school. He founded Duolingo in 2011, um, and it did, of course, back to the product again. Leveraged some some new technologies. Right, it leveraged, you know, the internet. It leveraged mobile uh, technologies, um, but much of the the innovation was really in how uh, the business model worked. Um, they adopted a freemium pricing model, which means that you can download Duolingo and start to learn a language at no cost. <clears throat> um, and over time, uh, you know, if, if you want to buy a premium version of the product, then you pay for it, right? So freemium does not mean free forever. Freemium means free to start. Um, and then pay for the premium services, right? And, and that was essentially uh, the model that Duolingo established. Now, I would tell you too that, that they didn't necessarily start with a lot of clarity around exactly how that was gonna work. That evolved over time, <clears throat> which is gonna get me to how you properly use a business model canvas and a tool like this. Um, I say in this slide that they're the first Pittsburgh-based unicorn. People like to say that frankly, especially around Carnegie Mellon. Um, they are certainly the most recent unicorn, but they're not the first Pittsburgh-based unicorn. Respironics was uh, a billion dollar company. Um, there are a number of others uh, that were founded here, but they were from a, a different era and from our new era, um, our more recent era, Duolingo would, would be considered the first Pittsburgh-based unicorn. They just did a valuation about a year ago on a funding at a billion dollars. <clears throat> Great company, completely changed um, uh, uh, the, the digital learning market um, and essentially took it away from Rosetta Stone by leveraging new technologies, but also leveraging new business models 
that were enabled by those technologies. Um, now, Luis also started a company called ReCAPTCHA, right? And ReCAPTCHA uh, was, was founded um, right here in our computer science school. It was sold to Google um, for, I think, around $27 million. Um, but, uh, you know, I think one of the things that's unique about ReCAPTCHA is that the business model is really what made this product work. So if you're not familiar with ReCAPTCHA, you are, you just don't know it. ReCAPTCHA is the tool that's used on just about any e-com site uh, where you prove that you are a human being and not a robot, right? So originally uh, that required um, a, uh, a task where you would uh, essentially be uh, writing down uh, words that are usually tilted and sometimes kind of uh, strange looking um, to prove that you you are able to read and 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 you know transcribe essentially what you saw on the page. What you don't realize is that you were essentially transcribing old uh, text from the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and other publications who had product that, you know, content that had been around for years, but was not in a digital form. Um, and you were free labor. By way of doing so, you were also um, proving that you weren't a robot because, you know, a robot wouldn't, wasn't able to do that, right? So, so the business model here was finding a third party um, who uh, could derive value from you proving that you are a human being, right? And that, that is something that was very unique about that idea, right? Um, they sold to Google for about 28 million and then, then Luis used some of the funds for that to start uh, Duolingo, right? So another example of how business models are, are uh, part and parcel to what makes your product innovative and unique. And another example, I'll do this one very quickly, is Apple, right? So Apple started, was started by Steve Jobs and, and Steve Wozniak back in the 70s. Um, and it was all about taking computing technology and, and making it personal, making it easy to use. Uh, but they, of course, had a single platform tech, uh, philosophy, which was that the operating system and the hardware would be developed together so that they would work seamlessly and work well. Very different, for instance, than, than what was the IBM and Microsoft arrangement of the day. Um, and uh, it worked for a while. But of course, in the mid 80s, Steve Jobs was, was fired as the CEO. Um, and the company tried to go a different direction, which really didn't work very well. Um, and uh, in 1996, it had a rebirth. When Steve rejoined the company, he adopted a new strategy, which was a mobile hub strategy. So at that time, the PC, the, 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 the computer, the laptop was the hub, and the iPad, the iPhone, the iPod were all um, mobile technologies with iTunes connecting everything together. Very unique strategy. Um, and it, you know, if you if you read up on that phase of Apple's development, uh, in most cases, people really credit the idea of iTunes uh, uh, and the the business model that surrounded that as being the kind of cornerstone approach that that brought Apple back, right? And that was really not a technology play; that was a business model play, right? So, you know, we had the iPod, the the iPhone. Um, today, Apple is one of the most uh, viable companies in the world. Last example, IKEA, not technology, right? So it doesn't have to be technology. IKEA is a Swedish company founded way back in the 20s, um, furniture. Um, and it transformed itself in the mid 80s to uh, what we know of today as IKEA, right? And the innovative business model is essentially that uh, they took a reasonably high product and, um, and what, uh, essentially had the customers become their, their manufacturers, right? Their assembly line. Um, by way of doing that, there were efficiencies that they could translate throughout the entire value chain. So if you go to an Ikea and you look at a bed, 
um, you know, you, you're not going to buy that bed. You're going to buy a, a series of boxes and instructions on how to put that bed together. Um, and by the way, if, the, if you want to pay somebody to assemble it, you can pay extra for that, right? But by way of doing that, their distribution channel, uh, their inventory, um, their sales, everything changes dramatically. And they are able to offer a fairly high quality product at a, 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 com a very competitively and competitively advantageous for them price point, right? So it doesn't have to be technology um, businesses, but business model is always important. So I hope I've made that point. So now let me dive into this. And I like to start with, I mentioned earlier that I'm an alumni, right? I was in your, I was a student here. I was in your shoes. Um, Don Jones uh, was one of my professors when I was a student back in the 90s. Great serial entrepreneur, great mentor of mine, great mentor of Dave Mawenny, the head of the Swartz Center. And, and Don liked to, to, uh, to hammer home a piece of advice to me in particular. And this is what he said. I've never forgot it. Stop making business more complicated than it needs to be. Keep it simple, right? And I have uh, tried to adopt and live by that, that approach in everything that I do. <clears throat> and I'm going to do that when I show you how to use this tool. So this is the business model canvas. Hopefully some of you have seen this. It has nine different boxes. Um, and it's easy to see in some of these words. Don't worry about the fact that they're really small. I'm going to take you through what they say. <clears throat> it's easy to see why somebody might look at this as a checkbox. Like, so let's think about the type of revenue streams and you know, what about variable revenue? And what about fixed costs? And what about transaction fees, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's important to think about all the items that are on this canvas, but there's a very specific way that I like to show people to use this. So let's start at 50,000 feet. This canvas really has two sides to it. The right side from value propositions over is all externally focused. As a matter of fact, customer focused, right? So everything on the right side is who's my customer? What value do they get from this product? What's my share of their value and how am I going to deliver it, right? Externally focused. Everything on the left side is internally focused and execution focused. What do I need to deliver this product? Do I need a partner? What resources do I need? What's it going to cost and can I make money at it, right? So external focus on the right, internal focus on the left. <clears throat> now, there's a very specific order that I recommend people use this tool. And it is not start at the left and go to the right, or start at the right and go to the left. You're gonna see that I'm gonna make you jump around this, this tool a little bit, and it's for a very specific reason. So the very first section when you are mapping out uh, your business model canvas is to define your customers, right? So who am I creating value for? Usually there's more than one customer involved with almost any product, right? But they're not all equal. So who's the most important customer? Generally that's the customer that's paying me for the product, right? But um, every customer um, has to derive value and provide value into the value chain for your, for your product, right? So, you know, think about um, who are my customers who are my most important customer and be very careful to segment your, your target customers uh, uh, to sufficient detail. So um, very rarely is one market uh, homogeneous. There are segments within it. And when you go out and do customer discovery, for instance, Seth talked about he wants to have people work with him on customer discovery. Right? When, when startups do customer discovery, it is not unusual, especially with the first pass, that you get conflicting information. You know, think of it as uh, data level noise, right? white noise in your signal. Uh, if you get that when you're doing customer discovery, it is almost always the case that that's occurring because you haven't uh, sufficiently defined the segments within, within your market. 
because if you sufficiently define those, you generally get very clear feedback from your customers as to what they need, what the value is, et cetera. It doesn't conflict. But if you have two or three segments mixed together in more of a mass market kind of uh, uh, format, you can sometimes get confusing data from customer discovery. So segment your, your market sufficiently so that you can go out and do customer discovery on each segment with sufficient detail. And when it comes to customer segmentation and customer definition, I'm, I'm looking for detail here, right? So what, what's, what are the attributes that define this segment as unique? Um, how many of them are there? Um, you know, define them geographically or by demographics or whatever the qualifying characteristics are for that segment. And I'm a big proponent of numbers, right? Define them with numbers, quantifiable numbers. Detail is important when it comes to customer segmentation and customer definition. Now, after you've defined the customer segments, then you have to define the value, right? <clears throat> And the reason the value proposition is second is because it is the value that your customer sees from your product, right? So, um, you know, what value is the customer deriving from your solution in quantifiable terms? Now, I would tell you that value can be manifest really only in a few different ways, right? You can save somebody time, um, you can make money or save money, or you can create relationships of value. Um, and you know, you, you can generally quantify those. Seth, I see your, your hands up. Yes, um, this is back to customer segments, but it's related to this value proposition. So how are customers different than users? So for instance, with Core, we have many different stakeholders. We've got merchants in the community, we have their customers, we have community organizations, we have the municipal right. government. They're not all customers, they're definitely all users. Maybe they are all customers, I, I, I'm, I, that's my question. Yeah, so in, in my way of thinking, they are all customers, Seth, right? A user may not be paying you for the product. They could be an employee if it was a business to business thing. You know, my, my company, Sovasage, has respiratory therapists who use my product. They're not paying me for it. Their employer is. But if, if, if my product is too difficult to use or isn't solving their problem, I'm not going to get paid for it very long, right? So, so they're also customers. So, and in that, looking at it from the perspective of your situation, would the patients of the respiratory therapists also be one of your customer segments? Absolutely. Yes. So, so my, my med stage that I talked about, um, <clears throat> we used, and that, this is 10, 10, actually, gosh, 20 year old technology. Now, uh, we used, uh, IVR automated phone calls, right? We had to make that friendly enough for a patient to be willing to participate in it because if they didn't participate, there was no value derived for the home care company who was paying me for the product, right? So while the patient wasn't paying me a penny, they really were, they were contributing value by participating in the process with my product. So they're customers. But again, I go back to not all customers are created equal either, right? So, um, you know, when I look at my current product, <clears throat> it's a clinical tool for respiratory therapists. I need to make it usable. I need to make it valuable for the therapist, but most importantly, I need to make it economically, um, you know, a, a sufficient return for the home care company because they're the payers for it. And if I do that, they'll make sure their therapists use it. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, yeah. Great clarification. So um, the most important thing that, that I want to say about value proposition is if, if you are defining uh, three customer groups in your customer segmentation, and then within one of your segments, you, within one of your customer groups, you actually segment it into two sections. Um, that gives you four separate groups. You really need to be thinking about the value proposition 
for each of those four groups, right? So if you have seven customer um, groups defined, you need to have se at least seven value propositions. And I really challenge people when they use this to make sure that they've thought through what is the value proposition for each of those customer groups um, and quantify it as much as possible, right? So again, detail is very important. Now, um, <clears throat> when I look at um, defining uh, value propositions, I go back and I always hear Don Jones in the back of my mind saying, keep it simple, right? So you, you should always think about value proposition in terms of simple, quantifiable terms, right? You know, it should be dollars, it should be time, it should be the value of a relationship, and it has to be relative to the competitive solutions. This is a really important point. People tend to look at these things and, and, and assess value based on what they think uh, the value of this product is over doing nothing, right? Well, every customer has a competitive alternative. It could be that doing nothing is the only alternative they have, uh, but usually there is some, even if it's a, a, you know, a poor solution, there is some uh, method that they've derived to solve a problem, right? So you need to make sure that you think about the, the, the relative value over the competitive solutions and consider what we call the goodness factor, which means it has to be significantly better, right? Somebody's not going to do the switch to your product because it's 5% better than what else is out there. You know, switching costs are just too great for that. It generally needs to be three times better in one form or another. It, it's, it's three times less expensive or it's, it's three times faster at the same price, right? You have to think about how to make something significantly better. And again, in value propositions, detail is important. After you've defined the value proposition, then you're gonna to switch to revenue, right? So we did customer, we did value proposition, and now we're on to revenue. But let's stop for a minute and talk about what I mean when I say revenue. So, what, what do you think revenue is? When I say revenue, somebody uh, let me know what you think that means to you. What is revenue? Just go ahead and unmute and, and give me your best shot at that one. I know these web conferences are a little bit um, awkward sometimes, but please just go ahead and give us your best shot. I will. Um, I'd say revenue is defined by someone giving you something for something that you can create. So whether that's money, data, or something in between, it's like the willingness to exchange something for something that you can create value with. Wow. Thank you. That, you know, I almost always get answers like, well, it's, it's, it's what you get paid for a product. It, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, your, your income, those kinds of things. I almost never get somebody that gives me the direct answer the first time. So great job. Yeah. So, I mean, when I think of revenue, it is a, it is the way your customer rewards you for value, right? It, it's how they tell you what it's worth for them, right? And it has to be reflective of that value, value, and it has to be quantifiable, right? And so when, when you think about revenue, it is inextricably linked to the customer's value. It's your share of that value, right? So if, if I'm generating $100 worth of value, um, my customer is not going to pay me $100. Uh, my revenue will be some share of that $100 of value. And it's important, obviously, that there's enough of that to make this worth all of our while to focus on, right? Because the most valuable uh, uh, commodity any of us have is time, right? So we don't want to waste time on opportunities that are not big enough, that aren't valuable enough, right? So revenue is really a way to kind of answer that question, right? So I always like every business I've ever done has started out on the back of a napkin just like this. So we're going to do a very simple back of the napkin example 
of the kind of logic I want you to use when you think about revenue when you do a business model canvas analysis, right? So you've already defined the customer and you define what their value is. So in my example, let's say that we're generating $100 worth of value for a customer. I also introduced to you the concept of a goodness factor, right? Again, the idea of goodness factor is that you have to generate enough value over the competitive solutions to, to overcome customers' switching costs, right? Now, Don used to say three. In today's day and age, three is probably the minimum, right? You really want to try to get closer to 10. And I've seen many successful businesses that are in that in that window, right? I would say MidSage had a goodness factor of five, right? And did quite well with a, with a goodness factor of five, right? But let's target 10. If you want a goodness factor of 10, which will make a product saleable um, and rapid growth, um, your share of that value then is $100 divided by 10, right? So your share is 10 bucks. Um, it's important to kind of just go through that and figure out what do I think my share of this value will be as I'm looking at this business model. And of course, once I have that, I can start to look at, well, how many customers are there? What's the value per customer? How big is this market opportunity for me? Now, um, in my example here, it comes out with $100 million is the market potential. And I'm always curious to hear, what it, it, does anybody think that that is uh, too small a market potential to go after? I'm not seeing any no's. Usually there are some no's, right? Depends on the investment. It, it depends upon... Well, so it does depend on upon the, the investment, but it really depends upon the goals of the founders, right? So a hundred million dollar market might be a very nice uh, uh, lifestyle business. It might be a business that you can flip for a, 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 a reasonable price, uh, but it's not the kind of business that you're going to go IPO with. It's not going to be the next unicorn if that's the, 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 the full market potential, right? It depends upon the goals of the company and the founders, and it does impact uh, the investors as well, right? So, you know, you're, you're not likely to get venture capital funding for a business idea that has a full market potential of $100 million. You just, it's not big enough um, to get uh, that kind of funding. Doesn't mean you can't fund it. You probably have to go you know, an angel route or some other different routes that you can go after, right? So once you start quantifying how big the market is by looking at the value proposition, the number of customers, and now your share of that value, which is revenue, you can start to think about, well, how am I going to fund this venture? Um, and do I want to go forward with this venture at all, right? So is it big enough? Uh, so this guy um, is Jeffrey Goldblum. Some of you might know him. Um, he was the star or one of the stars of Jurassic Park, one of my favorite movies. Also, by the way, Jeffrey is, a, is a, from Pittsburgh, so he's a good Pittsburgh boy. Um, but he has a quote in here that I always love, and I think it applies in this particular case. He was asked what he thought of Jurassic Park. This is before everything just went to hell in the movie, right? And, and he, he was not in favor of it. And his comment was, you know, you were so busy... Uh, with whether you could do this, that you never stop to think whether you should, right? That's where you are in the business model canvas right now. It, this is a sanity checkpoint. Is the market big enough? Is the value proposition big enough? And is my share of it uh, big enough to make this something that is worth my time for the next five years or whatever it is? No startup or very few startups are a one-year endeavor. Most of them take a lot longer than you think. One of my peers on the faculty, Craig, talks about his business, which he, he sold to uh, Smith & Nephew for a quarter of a billion dollars. Um, he said he was an overnight success 13 years in, making, in the making, right? It really took him 13 years. People only hear about the last, you know, 15 months, right? So, 
Most startups take a lot longer and you need to value that time. This is an opportunity for you to make sure that you're really uh, working on the most valuable uh, uh, product. So with that said, if you look at this business model canvas, which you can download off of uh, you know, the internet at strategizer.com, um, they're gonna give you a lot of detail on revenue, right? They're gonna go through different types of revenue streams, fixed streams, dynamic pricing, um, and, and there's a lot of different ways that you can slice and dice the pricing of this. And what I'm gonna tell you is, I don't care about that level of detail. Not at this stage. What I do care about is what is my share if I give the customers sufficient return to make this a product that I can sell, right? Which goes back to the goodness factor. Um, and it, you know, in my example of $100 value, $10 pricing, I know that 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 you know, if I'm even even an okay salesperson ought to be a pretty easy decision if those numbers are accurate. And that's all I really want right now as I'm analyzing a business is, is there enough value um, to, to have a, a big enough market um, and to have enough revenue that I can do this profitably? And I don't worry about the details of how I'm going to price it beyond that in the first pass. Why do I say that? I say it for a very simple reason. If you try to figure out those details at the early stage, you will almost certainly be wrong because you don't know enough yet to really determine what those are. And Allison, by the way, time check. We have until what, 1.30? Yes, 1.30, so okay. 20 minutes. Just wanted to make sure. Yeah. So I always have that, that feeling right about this stage of this talk, like I'm taking too long, right? Because so far, we have nine boxes and I've covered three. We're only a third of the way through it. We've talked about customers, we've talked about value, and we've talked about revenue. Seth, I see your hands up. Sorry, uh, sorry to slow you down. I, no, no, I'm no, a little okay. confused about goodness factor. It was in the denominator on the back of your napkin. And so that means the more goodness you have, the less revenue you have. Uh, well, yes, mathematically. I don't, I don't think I understand what goodness factor is. Yeah, so goodness factor is essentially, you can almost think of it as return, right? So um, think of it from the customer perspective, not from the company's perspective. If, if I'm the customer for your product and you save me $100 and I paid 10 bucks for your service, you know, that, then I have a 10x return. And that's what I'm looking for is... is if, if it's a 1x return or a 2x return, eh, I, might, I might buy your product, but it's, it's a lot harder decision than a 10x return. That's a no-brainer, right? And that's what, that's what I'm looking for is something that is so valuable to the customer it return or value as opposed to the cost of changing what I'm doing that it's well worth my while and an easy decision to go forward with it. Okay, thank you. So, so you're right. I could have had the, the goodness factor at three. And if you're getting a hundred dollars of value, I could charge you $33 for it. Right. And you no, know, maybe, maybe you can get away with that. Right. In which case that's more profit and more value for the company. But when I'm doing early stage planning like this, I'm going to look at worst case and I want to make this an easy sale. So I'm thinking, 10x, right? But it's somewhere okay. in that range of 3 to 10x. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about three boxes, right? We're only a third of the way through. But just, let's just think about what we've uh, already gone through with just these three boxes so far, right? We, we now have detailed our customer in our segments in sufficient detail to know what their qualifying criteria are, how many there are, um, how they're segmented, um, we also know how they derive benefit from our product um, and uh, whether, there's en whether there's enough money left over to, to build a, a company that's worth my while to focus on, right? 
So that's a great deal all by itself. We know a lot from those three points. And I would say that, that they are uh, probably the three most important things we need to know. But there's one other thing that we also know from doing this process that's not quite as obvious. And that is we know what we don't know, right? Now, why do I say that? If I'm as a team, as a team, if we're focusing on defining the customers and how many they are, and what the qualifying criteria are, and how they drive value. Guaranteed, if you go into enough detail, you're gonna, you're gonna identify gaps in your assumptions, in your hypothesis, and in the information that you have. And I'm gonna tell you that you should not hide from those gaps. You should actually highlight them in the business model canvas because those gaps will be the areas that you should focus on. Why? Because those are your risk points. And entrepreneurship is all about managing risk as early in the process as you can, right? That's how you get a company to build value is by reducing the risk. By the time you have 50% market share and you dominate a market segment, you know, your risk is mostly execution, right? That's a very different risk level then when you're starting out and nobody's ever seen this product before and it's never really been done this way before and you're not sure whether people are going to adopt it, right? Very dis different risk profile at that point. So your job is to manage that risk profile and reduce it. Um, and the way you do that is by identifying where your risk points are and this process will help you do that. So you need to make sure that you understand what you don't know so that you can focus on those items. Now, we have 15 minutes left, and I'm actually not off on timing very far here, because what I typically do from here on out is go through the rest of this pretty quickly. Now, why do I do that? Not because I'm running out of time. I do it because those first three boxes are by far the most important. If you make a mistake, if you're not honest with yourself on customers, value, and revenue streams, the rest of this is just a colossal waste of time. You have to get those first three right. And frankly, those first three are typically where most of the risk is. So focus on those first. Spend 90% of your time on customers, value, and revenue stream. And then focus on the rest of this, this uh, tool, right? So I do want to spend a little time on the other two boxes on the right because a lot of times people get these confused and there is a slight amount of overlap. <clears throat> so customer relationships. Uh, when you are defining customer relationship, what you need to be doing is defining what your customer expectations are for your business, right? You know, is this a web app that's self-service that requires very little assistance? Um, or is this a business to business solution that you need to do a deployment on, you need to do integrations with, um, perhaps you even have to have an account manager in a data product, right? All of which, by the way, ended up being true with MedSage. And uh, there are costs associated with that, that you have to make sure you're planning for upfront when you're analyzing your business. So customer relationships defines what their, the customer's expectations are for your product, your service, long-term, short-term and long-term, right? Channels, on the other hand, are more about how do they get your product, right? So starting out with how do they know your product exists? How do they become aware of your product? How do they figure out whether that product is useful to them and actually solves a problem that they share, right? So that they evaluate the product, that tends to be more of an analytic, analytics type of exercise, due diligence. Um, at some point, they have to purchase it, which is, tends to be um, uh, more of an emotional decision, quite frankly. Most, most purchases are done on an emotional level, not on a, an analytical level. Uh, but they have to know how to purchase it. They need to sign and review a contract, perhaps. Uh, <clears throat> then you have to deliver it. Right, and that could involve distribution, that could involve um, uh, consulting, um, and then you have to support 
going forward, like selling products into that customer uh, for the future, um, which may be synergistic to your product. <clears throat> this after sales function is where customer relationships and channels overlap a bit. Um, and I think it's the source of why many students sometimes confuse channels and customer relationships, right? They are distinctly different, but they overlap on the after sales side. <clears throat> so that is the external facing side. Now let's look at the left side. And I'm going to go through this part pretty quickly, right? You know, key activities. What do we have to be good at, right? What are our core expertise? Um, do we have to have relationships? Do we have, a, have to have a manufacturing capability? Uh, do we have to have a hosting service that we use or that we build? Um, you know, what, what are our key technical or relationship-based um, activities? And then what resources are required to support that? <clears throat> now, these are specifically internal resources here. Uh, now, not all resources come internally, right? Many times you can leverage partners um, and you ought to definitely challenge yourself to think about, are there, are there partners who can help us? Help us reach the customer, help us produce the product, help us distribute the product, perhaps have relationships that um, we can leverage to get to the customers that, that we want to, uh, to, to, to reach and to service. Um, <clears throat> maybe there are partnerships that help us with economy of scale issues. Um, and eventually some of these partners might be acquirers as well, right? So define your customers. And then lastly, define your costs, right? So at this point, we are now at the last box, right? And notice I actually left cost as the very last item. I did that because you really need to be thinking about all of the things we've gone over thus far in order to understand your costs. Um, and there are a couple different elements of costs that you need to worry about. You need to worry about what are your fixed costs, right? Do you have, did you have to have an office? Do you have to have a warehouse? Do you have to have hosting? What's that cost? Um, it, you know, if there is an SMS element to your product, what are the variable costs? Like every time you deliver uh, an increment of value to the customer, what's it cost you, right? And uh, do, does your revenue, uh, is it large enough to overcome uh, your variable cost, right? And not only how is it today, but how will it be at scale? I see we've got some comments up here. Let's just see if we have any questions. Okay. Yep. Um, okay, so to wrap this part up, I go back to the back of a napkin, right? So we started with value. We determined with a 10x goodness factor that our share of the value is $10, right? Per customer increment, right? So if our direct cost uh, to deliver the value, so this is the variable cost is $3, then I've got a margin of $7, right? Uh, for every incremental customer that we generate. So the big question I need to, to ask myself at this point is, if there are 10 million customers out there and I can net $7 for every one of those that I use, you know, I have the potential to generate $70 million on some incremental basis. That might be on an annual basis. It could be on whatever, whatever, whatever metric you have, right? You need to think about what are, my, what are my fixed costs, you know, which in, could include the cost to develop the product before I can actually ever sell it, um, you know, any, any facility investments I have to make, and I need to be able to overcome those fixed costs, right? So if my fixed costs are a million dollars in a $70 million opportunity, I, I can now start to look at what are my what are my appropriate strategies for investment? Which Alex talked about early on, we were talking about revenue. Now you can start to look at, <clears throat> is there enough, uh, enough margin here to cover my fixed costs and overhead? And what's the investment strategy that makes sense for that? 
Uh, but it, it, that's the last step you go through as you use this tool. Now, um, I haven't mentioned this yet, but I do want to make sure I cover this. Um, there are a couple kind of important techniques to, to get the most value out of this. Um, so the first thing is that the business model canvas in the startup world is your internal business plan. When, when I was a student at Tepper back in 1997, uh, we all wrote these really elaborate business plans with very well written market strategies and financial analysis. Um, and all of that is uh, out the window today. Today, the internal business plan is the business model canvas. Um, if you go out to Silicon Valley, a, lo a lot of investors won't talk to you if they, if they don't see you know, a cohesive business model canvas you know, in your office. Now, it, is, it has to be as specific as possible and quantified whenever possible. Focus on the customer segments, the value proposition. Um, use the order that I presented uh, because that's the logical order for, for deriving all of this. And make sure throughout that you identify your unknowns, right? And this is where I get to the, the, the real proper way to use this. Typically, what I recommend is that the business model canvas is something that you download and print out, go to Kinko's and print out a really large size, size of it, or you just draw it on a whiteboard, right? And you fill out each of these sections in either green, yellow, or red marker, right? So green is an item that you feel you have sufficient clarity on. It's not a high risk, it's a no. Yellow is an area where you may have some unknowns that you wanna pay attention to, and red is a very high risk area, right? By putting it up so the whole team can see it, it becomes a collaborative tool for the entire team, right? They can see it every time they walk into the team room, they know where the risks are, um, and they know where they should be focusing you use that as a planning tool that evolves over time, right? So it doesn't stay the same. It's not a static tool. It's a collaborative tool that helps your entire team know what's going on, what's known, what's not known, and where we need to focus on our business model. Any comments, questions, discussion in our last few minutes? By the way, when we do this in person, I always like to pull up a whiteboard and, and have us do one together, but that's a little bit hard on, on Zoom, so maybe next fall. I wonder if we could just talk a little more about um, the multiple stakeholder versus, you know, sort of singular customer segment kind of aspect a little bit. and you know, exactly where do you draw the line between, you know, a stakeholder and a customer? You know, you could almost consider in the med device space, for instance, a, you know, a, a, a partner, you know, a strategic partner as a customer to a degree, because you're basically shopping your business around as a potential value to a larger uh, business, right? And uh, what I see a lot of happening these days is that these larger manufacturers are cultivating uh, these these younger companies and investing in them directly to make sure that when they do decide to acquire, they're getting the product they want. So, you know, is, is that a case where you would consider like, you know, a potential licensing partner, a customer versus a, a channel or, you know, how do you, you know, you, you kind of touched on that, but maybe we can talk about it through that lens now. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a great question. So, I mean, I'll, I'll use myself as an example, right? So with my SovaSage product, my customer is a, a home healthcare company, right? They're, they're the people who pay for my product. Um, but I work with payers who are their customers. Um, and some of them are actually investors in my company. Um, and they have to have a value proposition as well, right? So, you know, 
more detail is always better in defining all your stakeholders, which I think of stakeholders as customers, right? Whether they're paying for the product or not and defining what their win is from your product and what your win is from working with them, right? Because mark my word, if you're going to strike a deal with a partner, you're going to have that discussion, right? So the earlier you start defining that, the better. And by the way, it saves you a lot of wasted time, right? Because if there isn't a win-win scenario there, then you need to either reevaluate and identify one or, you know, don't waste your time in that particular area because that's not going to come to fruition. So, so there really is no level of detail that is too much detail when it comes to defining your customers. Now, that said, I also think it's important, uh, especially in the early days of a startup, to focus, right? And, and so early on, you know, you need to focus on who your primary customer is, and that's almost always, you know, the person that's paying you. Um, and if they have a customer they're using your product with that, that is required for them to drive that value, then, then they're probably equally or just below that in priority. And, and so I generally are defined and defining a number of customers, but I'm not treating them equally. I'm starting with my primary paying customer and all the enabling stakeholders that make that value uh, achievable for that customer. Uh, especially on my first pass through the canvas. And again, it's a, it evolves over time, right? So it will, it will become more detailed and some of the assumptions will change as you evolve at your company uh, in your business uh, plan. Does that, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's good. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, well, I hope I, I, I hope we all get back in the uh, on the campus sometime and I get to see all your business model canvases all over uh, the Swartz Center and the Computer Science School and Project Olympus and wherever else you're working on your business. So thanks for joining in.